morning, everyone. We're gathered here today in this auditorium because we all share a common purpose, to educate ourselves and listen carefully to the voices of people from our community and from history. To begin today's talk, please uh, join me in welcoming our first set of student introducers, Bonnie, Violet, and Nella. Good morning and welcome staff, students, and esteemed guests. Today, we have the honor of being part of an extraordinary event filled with inspiration, courage, and education. This event is one that will certainly leave a profound mark on our hearts and our minds. In addition to our school community, there are other members of the greater Westwood community here with us today. To begin our event, Rabbi Karen Citron, a distinguished member of the Westwood community and rabbi at Temple Beth David here in Westwood, will be saying a few words. She will share her wisdom and experiences with us so that we might better understand the significance of today's speaker. Before coming home to Massachusetts, Rabbi Karen was also a rabbi in California and Oklahoma. She served on the board of, of the Central Conference of American Rabbis and was a mentor for future rabbis. As a member of the Westwood community, her two kids currently attend Westwood High School. Finally, without further ado, let's collectively welcome Rabbi Karen Sutrim with enthusiasm and appreciation. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. I'm really honored um, that Thurston Middle School invited me back again to introduce our Holocaust speaker. Um, just a shout out to uh, Noah and other uh, teens here who go to Temple Beth David. This is wonderful because I get to start my day with you and end my day because our teen program meets uh, Wednesday evenings at Beth David. Um, in Jewish tradition, uh, we actually recognize the age of 13 as a really significant moment of bar and bat mitzvah. Um, Jewish tradition acknowledges that 13, you start becoming uh, young adults, taking responsibility for the world. So the speaker today is especially important. Um, as we like to say at Beth David, you have an important voice to add to our world and community. Um, I want to just take a moment to acknowledge that bringing in a speaker about the Holocaust seems more important now than ever. Uh, I know that you've all been learning about the pyramid of hate. And as you know, hatred starts with attitudes and words and actions, bullying, discrimination, and violence. I'm wondering if you know that anti-Semitism, uh, hatred toward Jews, and Islamophobia, hatred toward Muslims, is significantly on the rise right now in the United States since October 7th. At our synagogue here in Westwood, we have recently increased security in the last few months. These are hard times that we are all living in, and I believe that you can all make a difference. On a personal note, when we hear stories uh, from the Holocaust, this is personal for me and uh, especially for Jewish people. When I was growing up, I knew that there was something special about my great uncle Harry. It wasn't just his thick Polish accent that was hard to understand. He was different mainly because he did not talk about his past, not in the way that my other relatives did, who thrived on telling their stories over and over again. Maybe your grandparents uh, do that. My Uncle Harry had survived the Lodge Ghetto and several concentration camps, including Auschwitz. The numbers tattooed on his arm are forever engraved in my mind, 141421. My uncle did not start sharing his story until around the time that I was in high school. As Holocaust survivors were aging, there was a push to record their stories so that they could bear witness to this terrible chapter in human history. This time of devastating and nearly incomprehensible destruction and loss of life when humanity failed. In addition to six million Jews who were murdered, Millions of other people who the Nazis deemed less than human were killed. LGBTQ people, black people, political prisoners, 
people with disabilities. And this is why we are here today, to learn from personal stories, to learn from Dan Ottenheimer, who is here to tell us the story of your family and your father, Fritz. I'm sure that the story is not easy for you to tell. I encourage all of you to listen deeply and to not be silent in the face of hate, whether it's here in Westwood or anywhere where you may someday live. I'll just conclude by saying that there is a Jewish teaching that is now over 2,000 years old, which says in a place where there are no humans, strive to be human. In other words, when other people aren't behaving in a humane way, treat others with respect and dignity. Thank you, Mr. Oppenheimer. Thank you, uh, Facing History and ourselves, Jeff Smith, uh, for bringing your story here today. Thank you, uh, and good morning. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, just a quick thing before uh, Dan uh, shares uh, his family story. Um, I'm with an organization called Facing History and Ourselves, and we work uh, very closely with your teachers. We develop curriculum about <coughs> some key historical moments uh, in the world, and uh, one of them, the Holocaust, and we also deal with other uh, more modern genocide, Rwanda, uh, Sudan, Cambodia, Bosnia. And one of the things we talk about when these you know, the, these moments which are kind of reflect the worst in human beings, is that we have a, a, a slogan which says, people make choices and choices make history. And that in, you know, obviously in these big events, people had choices. Were they going to be part of the perpetrators? Were they going to help people who were the targets? You and, and I, in our own lives, on a smaller scale, obviously face choices about some moral questions and ethical questions, and that is something that you know we we the reason what what we do is look at these big issues, um, big events, and what are the ethical and moral questions that they raise, not only in history but in our own lives. So that's you're here really to hear Dan. So I'm going to hand this over to him and thank you very much. Oh, yeah. I don't All right, thank you so much. I'm going to invite down our last set of student introducers, Luke, Sophia, and Nico. Thank you, Rabbi Karen Citrin. In the coming years, we will have only a few Holocaust survivors alive to share their stories. Though memory fades over time, a survivor experience is like no other experience. However, there is much to learn from the sons, daughters, and grandchildren of these survivors as they share how their identity was shaped by their Holocaust history. Today, we have the honor of hearing from Dan Ottenheimer, son of Holocaust survivor Fritz Ottenheimer. Fritz was born in 1925 in Germany. The first eight years of his life were very typical. When Hitler came to power in 1933, Fritz and his family were forced to endure increasing discrimination and per persecution. Fritz's father's clothing store was boycotted and the family eventually had to sell it. At one point, Fritz and his family helped hundreds of Austrian Jewish people cross the border into Switzerland. In November of 1938, Fritz witnessed his father's arrest on what is now called Kristallnacht. After his father's release from the Dachau concentration camp, Fritz and his family immigrated to the United States in 1939. Fritz was 14 years old. In 1944, Fritz volunteered to become a member of the U.S. Army, and in 1945, he was deployed to Germany. When the war ended, Fritz came back to the United States. Dan Oppenheimer, Fritz's son, was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1957. Dan loves the outdoors, notably hiking, camping, bicycling, and caving. Dan came to Boston in the 1970s to attend college. He remains in the area, working at several software companies, both as a software engineer and as a manager. In 2019, Dan approached Facing History and asked if he could share his father's stories about facing, uh, of the Facing History program. In his talk, Dan explains what happens to his father and tells his father's stories about 
opportunities and helped his family and during an escape from Nazi oppression. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mr. Oppenheimer. Thank you, everyone. I'm here to share some stories that are very important to me, stories about what it was like for my dad growing up as a Jewish child in Nazi Germany. My dad passed away in 2017, six years ago, but these are stories that I feel still need to be shared as often as possible. When I was growing up, um, when I was your age, I thought there was nothing different about my dad, that he was just like all of the other dads in the neighborhood. I didn't know that he was a Holocaust survivor who had fled from Germany in 1939, just before the start of World War II. Um, my dad refused to talk about his past. I think he did it because he didn't want my sister and I to have to deal with this knowledge as we were growing up. But although he didn't talk about it, I did have a couple of clues, a couple pieces of the puzzle about my dad's past. I knew that my grandfather had been a soldier for the German army during World War I. I knew that my dad had been born in Germany, but that he had been a U.S. soldier during World War II. We were Jewish. I knew we were Jewish. We belonged to a synagogue in the Squirrel Hill section of Pittsburgh. And I knew that during World War II, a lot of Jews were killed by the Nazis in Germany. But although I knew these individual little facts, I never really tried to understand the big picture. I never thought about what I didn't know. I never wondered about what my dad's life was like in Germany and how he came to be in the United States. So I graduated from high school and, and came up here to Boston to go to college. And a couple years after that, my dad changed his mind. He decided it was time to start sharing his story. And I think it happened about the time that my sister had her first kid because my dad started to realize that his grandchildren wouldn't know anything about what happened to him if he remained silent. So my dad wrote his memoirs and then he became a volunteer speaker at the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh. And over the next several years I learned his story as I heard him speak it several times and I also read his book. My dad spent more than 30 years talking, sharing his stories, primarily at schools in western Pennsylvania. But then, when he turned 90, he started to develop some serious health issues. And that's when I realized the responsibility to tell my dad's stories was probably going to be passing to the next generation very soon. My dad passed away when he turned 92 in 2017. My mom passed away in 2018. And as you heard in the intro, in 2019, I contacted the organization Facing History and Ourselves and volunteered to be one of their second generation Holocaust speakers. Um, for a couple of years, I was mainly doing talks over Zoom because nobody was actually in school, but uh, now I'm back to doing talks in person and I'm very happy to be with you today and to be able to share my dad's stories with you. So let me get started. My dad was born in 1925 in Konstanz, Germany. Konstanz had about 35,000 people at the time and it was located right on the southern border of Germany, right on the border with Switzerland. My dad, growing up, had a very typical, ordinary childhood. He lived with his parents, my grandparents, and he lived with his big sister, Ilza, my Aunt Ilza. The family lived in an apartment, and they didn't own a car. And those were both very typical for that time period in Germany. My grandfather had a small men's clothing store in Konstanz. And as I said, my dad had a very typical childhood. Now, most of his schoolmates and his neighbors weren't Jewish. They were Christian. 
And that's because only 2% of the Konstanz population was Jewish at that time. But the thing is, in the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s in Germany, it really wasn't that significant what your religion was. And my dad and his family, they're very well assimilated into the community there in Konstanz. So my dad went to a public elementary school and he um, liked to play soccer. He also liked to go on hikes. He did a lot of things with his school friends, his big sister Ilza. Um, he also went to the Konstanz synagogue once a week for services and went to religious school once a week at the synagogue as well. All of that changed in 1933, which was the year that Hitler came to power. Life got very bad for my dad, as it did for all of the Jews in Germany, very quickly. The radio stations in Konstanz started to play propaganda all day, accusing Jews of being the enemies of Germany. The Konstanz newspapers started to print art articles that were also very anti-Jewish, accusing local Jewish residents of having committed illegal or immoral acts. Sound trucks started to cruise through Konstanz, broadcasting anti-Jewish propaganda, including telling people not to buy from Jewish-owned stores. And then these guards, stormtroopers, were posted outside of Jewish-owned stores, there to try to intimidate potential shoppers, trying to scare them into not going into the stores. And that included my grandfather's store. There were a lot of changes at my dad's school. He went to a public elementary school. All of the kids had to go to a class called Race Studies class. And in that class, they were taught about the supposed superiority of the German or Aryan race and the dangers of all of the inferior races, in particular the Jews. After school, all of the other kids went to Hitler youth meetings. And these were filled with lots more anti-Jewish propaganda, along with some paramilitary training. Once a week, all the kids went into an auditorium, probably something like this, and they listened to one of Hitler's speeches. And of course, those speeches were filled with all sorts of ranting and hate speech towards Jews. And then the kids were taught these new, supposedly patriotic songs that were really very anti-Jewish. My dad remembered one of the lyrics in particular. It went, when Jewish blood squirts from the knife, everything is going well. So imagine if you were Jewish and in an auditorium like this, and all of the other kids were singing one of these songs about stabbing Jews. Really very scary for my dad, very bewildering. The government started to announce new laws, all designed to discriminate against discriminate against my dad and the Jews. And these laws got worse and worse over time. Eventually, it got to the point where my dad was no longer allowed to go to concerts. He was no longer allowed to attend sporting events. He wasn't allowed to go to the movie theater. He wasn't allowed to use the town's swimming pools. My dad and his family weren't allowed to eat in town restaurants. If they went on a trip, they weren't allowed to stay in hotels. My dad wasn't even allowed to sit on the town's park benches. This was all very confusing to my dad. He really thought he was just an ordinary kid like all of the other kids, and yet all of these laws, all of these things were happening. One day, my dad and his family were listening to the radio when the radio announcer decided he needed to explain to his listeners about the German Jews. And this is what my dad remembered the announcer had to say. He said, 
Jews were devious, corrupt, and unscrupulous. They were a dirty, smelly foreign race, and that they were conspiring to destroy Germany. My dad turned to his parents and said, that announcer, is, is he talking about us? Aren't we Jewish? And my grandparents said, don't listen to that idiot. He's one of those Nazis. The German people are honest, decent, educated people, and they won't believe this nonsense. Well, my grandparents were wrong. Although some of their neighbors refused to believe the propaganda, others started to believe it. My dad remembered another day when a neighbor came over to the apartment to do some repairs. And when he arrived, he was wearing a little Nazi emblem on his lapel pin. My grandfather asked him why he was wearing the pin, and the neighbor replied that he wanted to support the government's efforts to straighten out the country. So my grandfather asked the neighbor, what did he think about how the government was treating the German Jews? And the neighbor said, well, it's unfortunate that the good Jews have to suffer along with the bad. Well, my grandfather asked him next, which ones are we? Are we the good Jews or are we the bad Jews? And the neighbor said, oh, what are you talking about? Of course, you're the good Jews. You're wonderful people. So then my grandfather said, you know most of the Jews here in Konstanz. Which of them are the bad Jews that we good Jews need to suffer along with? And the neighbor thought about this for a while. And then finally he admitted that every single Jew that he knew in Konstanz was a good, honest person. Well, my grandfather said, where are the bad Jews then? And this finally got the neighbor upset. He said, what are you talking about? Of course there's bad Jews. There's bad Jews everywhere. You listen to the radio, you read the newspaper, there's story after story about all the bad Jews in Konstanz, in all of Germany. And that was the power of this government-sponsored anti-Jewish propaganda. Many people wound up believing that the propaganda was true even when, if they bothered to look in front of their own eyes, they could see that it was false. Now, originally, or once Hitler came to power at first, business at my grandfather's store wasn't affected. But eventually, business started to decline. People became afraid to shop there. So eventually, my grandfather had no choice, but he had to sell the store. He briefly got another job as a traveling tie salesman, but he lost that job as well because he was Jewish. So my dad and his family put up with all this persecution, all this discrimination for a few years. But finally, in 1936, three years after Hitler came to power, they realized that it wasn't going to get better anytime soon. In fact, it was probably going to get worse. So they contacted relatives of theirs that were living, living here in the United States. And they got their relatives to agree to sponsor the family for immigration here to the US. So they put together this complex application process, sent it in. And then they had to wait. They were on a very long waiting list because there were a lot of Jews trying to come to the United States back then, back in 1936. And the US had a small quota of people that it would allow to immigrate from Germany to the US each year. And the US government was dragging its feet and wasn't even filling that quota. So there was this huge waiting list, and my dad and his family were just in the back of that waiting list, waiting for their, their application to come up and be reviewed. It took two years, two more years. But then in the spring of 1938, they were informed by the US consulate in Stuttgart that their application had come up for review. Reviewed and denied. 
We think it was denied because of an injury that my grandfather had suffered during World War I. Um, the U.S. officials thought that he wouldn't be able to get a job in the U.S. He would be a financial burden. And so they denied the application. My grandparents quickly contacted their relatives in the U.S. and got them to agree to put up a larger financial guarantee. And with this new larger bond, they reapplied to come to the U.S., which put them back on the waiting list, waiting for the application to be reviewed. And while they were waiting, Kristallnacht happened, the night of broken glass. You've probably studied Kristallnacht when you learned about the Holocaust. My dad remembered it very clearly. It was November 10th, 1938. My dad was 13 years old, and he was sleeping in the family apartment when he woke up suddenly in the middle of the night because he heard an explosion. He ran to the apartment window, looked out, and saw that the Konstanz synagogue was in flames. It turns out the synagogue had been blown up by the German secret, pol secret police, the Gestapo agents. Then, later that day, two Gestapo agents came to my dad's apartment, announced they were there to arrest my grandfather, refused to explain what he was under arrest for, and took him away. Now, this was a scene that played out throughout all of Germany on Kristallnacht, on the night of broken glass. Jewish stores were broken into, the windows demolished, which is why it's called the night of broken glass. Synagogues across Germany were all burned down, and 30,000 adult Jewish men were rounded up and arrested, taken away from their homes. My grandmother spent the next several weeks desperately trying to find out what had happened to my grandfather. No one would tell her anything. The mayor wouldn't say anything, the town police. She was really very frantic with worry, had no idea what was going on. It turned out my grandfather had been taken to Dachau concentration camp. Now, Dachau in 1938 was not an extermination camp. It wasn't a death camp. The gas chambers in the concentration camps were installed a few years after this. But Dachau in 1938 was still a very, very cruel political prison. All of the prisoners were woken up at dawn and forced out of the barracks to stand for roll call for an hour. When roll call was over, they were forced to march and jog around the camp the entire day. All the prisoners had to wear were thin cotton jerseys. And this was November, December in Germany, so frequently the temperatures were below freezing. The food they were given was not really edible. Twice a day, they got a bowl of thin greasy soup and a piece of moldy bread. The prisoners, once they ate the food, most of them got sick with dysentery. They had a very high fever, bloody diarrhea, and any time they tried to eat afterwards, they were violently ill. They would throw it all up again. So a lot of the prisoners at Dachau wound up dying just from the combination of the terrible food, getting sick, and not having adequate clothing when they were outside. After six weeks, my grandfather was released from Dachau. And he just showed up again one day at the apartment without any advance notice. He was very sick. He had lost a tremendous amount of weight. He was really barely alive, but he was alive and slowly started to recover. 
A few months after my grandfather was released from Dachau, the family got some good news. The U.S. consulate had reviewed their second application and had approved it. So in May of 1939, when my dad was 14 years old, the family took a train to France, boarded a ship, sailed across the Atlantic, and arrived in New York to start their new lives. Now, it wasn't all smooth sailing at that point. Um, my grandparents made my dad go to school as soon as he got to New York. And he didn't know any English. So it was a pretty tough time for him. He was put a grade lower than he was supposed to, should have been because he couldn't speak English. Um, he had a very thick German accent when he tried to speak those five or ten words that he knew. Uh, the kids were making fun of him. The teachers were losing their temper. It was not a good time. They really, no one knew what he had fled from. And so they were just, uh, on a good day, they were shunning him, leaving him alone. Fortunately, summer break started after just a couple of weeks, and my dad took a class in English over the summer. And he got pretty good at it. And in the fall, he did much better at school, especially um, after one of the teachers did this boys versus girls spelling contest, and my dad wound up being the last boy standing. So he really started to fit in after, after that, and did well enough that he applied to and got into the Bronx High School of Science a couple of years later, which is, uh, still is a very good STEM school in the New York area. And then, after my dad graduated from high school, as soon as he graduated, he enlisted in the U.S. Army. It was June of 1944, and my dad couldn't be drafted because he wasn't a U.S. citizen. But my dad really felt that he needed to be part of the U.S. effort to fight back against Nazi Germany. So he enlisted and went through basic training. And finally, in March, of 1945, just two months before the end of World War II in Europe, my dad was deployed back to Germany, back to the country where he grew up. Now, my dad was originally um, trained as an infantry rifleman. But as soon as he got to Germany, he was reassigned to a different group called the Military Government Security Guard because my dad could speak German fluently. And what this group did was followed along behind the U.S. front lines, behind the U.S. tanks. And they go into a city that had just been taken over by the U.S. forces. And my dad and his team would find someone who had never been a member of the Nazi party and make that person the mayor and make someone else who had never been a Nazi the police chief. And the team would make sure that food was coming into the town and utilities were working properly. And once it seemed like the town was doing okay on its own, they would just move on to the next city and do this all over again. So you could understand why it was really important to have someone who understood German well to, to be on that team. Well, as my dad moved from town to town, he was really shocked and horrified by all the terrible things he saw had happened there. Now, things were bad when my dad had fled from Germany back in 1939. My dad and his family had experienced all this discrimination, this persecution. There was the destruction of property um, and an imprisonment that occurred, all while he was still in Germany. But now that he had returned back to Germany, he saw that the Nazis and so many of the German citizens had all managed to work their way to the top of the pyramid of hate. Foreigners, people who were not German citizens, were treated like livestock. The Jews were treated like cockroaches. He just saw so many examples 
of times when people who were not considered German were starved, forced to do manual labor, and then murdered, killed when they were no longer needed for their function. Now my dad wasn't a liberator per se. He wasn't the, one of the first US forces to arrive at a concentration camp because he was behind the front lines. He was still asked on two occasions to go visit a concentration camp um, and to investigate things that had happened there. So he was in this role for a couple of months until May of 1945 when the war ended. Germany surrendered. The war in Europe was over. My dad spent another year in Germany working on the Nazi, the denazification effort. And then after a year, he was brought back to the US and discharged to resume his civilian life. So my dad and his family, his immediate family, they were very fortunate to escape when they did and to arrive in the US mostly unharmed. But my dad had other relatives who were not as fortunate. So I'd like to take just a minute right now to talk about the Wertheims, my dad's close relatives who lived in France, Uncle Leon, Aunt Martha, and Cousin Gigi. Aunt Martha was my grandmother's sister. Cousin Gigi was my dad's first cousin and was one year younger than my dad. The two families used to go on vacations together quite frequently. I know my dad talked about when he and his family used to go to France and visit the Wertheims and stay with them. So in 1940, Germany invaded France and immediately started to persecute all of the Jews who were living in France. Now by then, my dad and his family had already come here to the United States. They had been here for a year. And my grandmother and Aunt Martha used to write letters to each other all the time. And once Germany invaded France, they were actually still able to send letters to each other. Turns out the Red Cross supported sending letters from occupied Germany to other countries. So they were still writing to each other until 1942. Suddenly, in the summer of 1942, the letters from Aunt Martha stopped arriving with no advance notice. After World War II was over, my dad's family tried to find out what had happened. And they learned that in July of 1942, Uncle Leon, Aunt Martha, and Gigi had been deported to the Auschwitz concentration camp where they had been murdered. The picture you see here is one that was taken of my dad and Gigi when my dad was on his way here to the US. My dad and his family took that train to France, stayed overnight, with their relatives, and then boarded the ship to come here to the US. Gigi was 13 years old in this picture. She was 16 years old on the day that she was forced out of her home, put on a train, deported to Auschwitz, and murdered by the Nazis on the day that she arrived. So, let me just take a little water break. A lot of people, when they hear the stories about the Holocaust, they wonder, what were the ordinary German citizens doing, the ones who weren't Nazis, while all of this was happening? And I think people ask that question because they're wondering, if I was there, what would I have done if I had witnessed all of this? Or if I ever see something similar, 
I wonder what I would do. Now, we know that a lot of the German citizens were willing to just sit by and do nothing and just watch as the Jews were per persecuted or maybe even participated and profited from the persecution of the Jews. But my dad had some stories about people who didn't just stand idly by. And so that's what I'd like to do with you for the next few minutes is share a few of these stories that my dad had to tell. Now, the first story I'd like to share with you is actually the only story that I knew that I, when I was your age. And this was a story that my grandfather used to tell me. My dad didn't tell stories when I was your age. But my grandfather's story goes like this. It happened shortly after Hitler came to power. And on this morning, as my grandfather did almost every morning, he left his apartment building and proceeded to walk to the store, his store, to open it up for the day. But on this morning, as he approached the store, he saw standing outside the store for the first time was a German stormtrooper. So my grandfather turned around and went back to the apartment and proceeded to find his World War I service medals. Then he went back to the store and this time went in and put all of his medals on display in the store's display window. Next, my grandfather came outside the store and rolled up his shirt sleeve. This injury my grandfather suffered during World War I, while he was out on patrol, a bullet had gone through his arm, through his elbow, shattering the elbow making it so that he could no longer bend his right arm at the elbow. Incidentally, his handwriting was the worst. Um, and he had a very large scar on his right arm. So my grandfather stood outside the store, across from the stormtrooper, with his sleeve rolled up, exposing his scar, and waited. It wasn't long before the first townsperson, the first bystander, came by. And this man looked at the stormtrooper, looked at the medals in the window, looked at my grandfather and his scar. And then he turned to the stormtrooper and said, you're making a huge mistake. Mr. Ottenheimer is a war hero. He was wounded in battle. He served our country honorably. He deserve, deserves our thanks and our support, not our scorn. Well, the stormtrooper tried to ignore the bystander. He just stared straight ahead and refused to make eye contact. But then a second bystander came by and a third bystander. And each of them tried to explain to the stormtrooper that what he was doing was wrong. More and more people gathered and their voices got louder and louder and soon there was a huge crowd. And finally, the stormtrooper realized that he had failed in his mission of intimidation. In fact, the opposite had happened. So he deserted his post and went back to report to his superiors. That week, business at my grandfather's store picked up because the neighbors and the townspeople went out of their way to shop at my grandfather's store and to show their support for him. So this was a week when the citizens of Konstanz were willing to stand up to injustice, wanted to make a difference, wanted to fight back against the Nazis. However, as I told you, eventually they did become too afraid to shop at my grandfather's store and he did have to sell it. But the reason my grandfather told this story was it was an event where he was proud of both what he did and what his fellow townspeople did. You may be wondering about what happened to my dad's classmates. They were going to race studies class. 
They were going to Hitler youth meetings. They were listening to Hitler speeches during assemblies. They were learning all these terrible songs about stabbing Jews. But at the end of the day, they would come over to my dad's apartment, knock on the door, and ask if he could come out and play with them. So all of this propaganda didn't seem to affect them at all. However, eventually, my dad's friends were told by their parents that they had to stop playing with my dad. But even though they weren't allowed to play together, they still used to walk to and from school together as a small act of solidarity, friendship, and maybe a little bit of defiance as well. This next story I have to share with you took place in the spring of 1938. This was when Germany announced that they were going to annex Austria. Austria was a neighboring German-speaking country. And the German army, after this announcement, just marched into Austria. The Austrian government didn't try to stop this at all. Austria had become part of Germany. Not long after that, I don't know if it was a few days or a couple weeks, there was a knock on my dad's apartment door. And when they opened the door, they saw standing there was a family. And the family explained that they were an Austrian Jewish family who had tried to check into the hotel in Konstanz. But they were told that Jews were not allowed to stay in hotels in Germany. However, the hotel manager had suggested they come over to the Ottenheimer apartment, that the Ottenheimers would be able to put them up for the night. So my dad's family invited them in and fed them dinner and heard their story. The Austrian Jewish family said that their neighbors had broken into their home while they were in it, forced them out onto the street, and proceeded to ransack the home. While this was happening, the Austrian police had just stood there and watched and done nothing to try to stop it. The family felt fortunate that they managed to escape unharmed. And they had decided that what they were going to do next was flee to Switzerland. Now, Switzerland shared a border with Austria, just as it shared a border with Germany. But it was actually very difficult to cross over the border from Austria into Switzerland, just as it was difficult to cross over the border from Germany into Switzerland because of the Rhine River and Lake Konstanz. There's a very strong natural barrier that made it so you could really only cross where there were bridges. And of course, where there were bridges, there were also official border crossings and security guards. And this family didn't have any documentation that would allow them to enter into Switzerland legally. Um, Swiss, the Swiss government was very strict about who was allowed into their country. You either had to have a visa or you had to have a transit pass, something that showed that you had a visa to go to some other country like France um, or Spain or Italy. So you, then you were allowed to travel through Switzerland. So, what this family had decided was they, were, they wanted to come to Konstanz because they knew it was right on the Swiss border. And they were hoping they were going to find a way to sneak over the border. So the family stayed overnight with my dad's family. And the next morning, the two families went for a walk together. They were walking for a while until they got to a field. And then my grandfather said, do you see that st little stream there in the middle of the field? That's the border between Switzerland and Germany right here. What my grandfather had done was taken them to a special part of Konstanz known as the Altstadt, or the Old City. And the Old City portion of Konstanz was actually located on the south side of the Rhine River. <laughs> 
In fact, it's the only part of Germany that's located south of the Rhine. So it turns out that if you knew Konstanz pretty well, it was pretty easy to sneak over the border into Switzerland. Well, the Austrian Jewish family couldn't believe their good fortune. They hopped over this little stream and they were free. They must have contacted some of their Jewish friends back in Vienna, Austria, because a couple days later there was another knock on my dad's apartment door. It was another Austrian Jewish family. And over the next several weeks, there was a steady stream of Jewish refugees coming to my dad's apartment and spending the night there before being shown their way to freedom the next day. One day there was a knock on the apartment door. When my dad's family opened it, they saw standing there was a Konstanz police inspector. The police inspector invited himself in, and after some small talk, he explained why he was there. He said, I know what you're doing. You are helping to smuggle Austrian Jews into Switzerland. I'd like to help, but my help will cost a certain amount of money per person. Well, my grandparents were very alarmed by this conversation because it was very dangerous when you were Jewish back then to say no to law enforcement. And the amount of money he wanted per person was ridiculously small. Really, couldn't have been for a bribe. Well, my grandparents felt they had no choice. They agreed. And the next morning at the agreed upon time, the families that had been staying overnight with my dad all came out of the apartment, along with my dad's family, and all went down to the street in front of the apartment building. There as agreed upon was the Konstanz police inspector. The Austrian families handed over the money, and the police inspector handed back official documentation giving them permission to cross the border. Then, the police inspector handed all of the money to the taxi cab drivers who were waiting on the street. The money was cab fare. Everyone climbed into the cabs. They were driven to the border. The documentation was all in order. They were waved through, and they were all free in Switzerland. And this new arrangement continued for another several weeks, until finally the Swiss government decided that they were going to completely close their border. And from that point forward, any time someone illegally entered Switzerland, they were uh, deported back to Germany and usually sent to a concentration camp at that point. All in all, my dad and his family and the Konstanz police inspector helped about 300 Jewish refugees flee into Switzerland. And I view this Konstanz police inspector as a true upstander, someone who was willing to risk his career and probably the health and safety of his family in order to help these Austrian Jewish refugees find safety in Switzerland. So I'd like to close out my talk about my dad and his stories by sharing a few pictures with you all. My dad, once he started to talk about the Holocaust, he went back and visited Konstanz several times. And on three occasions, I was able to go back to Konstanz with him and visit it as well. So these are a couple of pictures from his visits. And these are all places that I've told you about. This first one, this building is where my grandfather's store was. And you can see those big display windows there. And perhaps imagine what it was like to have my, dad, my grandfather's medals on display there. And imagine what it was like to have a crowd gathering in front of this building while my grandfather and the stormtrooper are standing there. This is the apartment building where my dad was living during Kristallnacht. And that white building is where the synagogue was standing. So it was just the next 
building over the next lot next to the apartment building. So if you were asleep in this apartment building and there was an explosion in the next lot over, you'd probably wake up as well and run to a window to try to figure out what was going on. This is that field in the old city portion of Konstanz, where the border between Germany and Switzerland is just a little stream. And if you were an Austrian refugee trying to get to Switzerland, you could probably hop over that stream and not even get your feet wet. This picture I have here is one from a newspaper article that was written about one of the times that my dad was invited back to Konstanz. Uh, um, he was invited back by the mayor of Konstanz. And the organizers put together a reunion of my dad and some of his classmates. In the article, my dad is quoted as saying, how much he appreciated that his friends didn't treat him any differently despite all the propaganda they were being exposed to. And this is my last picture. And it is of a memorial to all of the Jews who were murdered during the Holocaust, um, all of the Konstanz Jews who were murdered during the Holocaust. I told you that my dad and his family spent three years trying to go through that application process to come to the U.S. from 1936 to 1939. They were very lucky that they got permission when they did and left in May of 1939. Because in September of 1939, Germany invaded Poland. And that disrupted the flow of immigrants from Germany to the U.S. because that was essentially the start of World War II. And the immigration uh, process was completely shut down in another year. So if it had just taken a few more months for that application process to play out, um, my dad and his family might never have gotten permission to immigrate to the U.S. They would have been stuck in Germany. So what would have happened next? Well, in October of 1940, just one year later, all of the Jews who were still living in Konstanz and the surrounding area were all forced out of their homes and deported to the Gers internment camp in France. They were then forced to stay there until 1942, two years later, when they were deported again, this time to the Auschwitz and Sobibor extermination camps, where they were all murdered. So my dad and his family could have wound up with their name on this memorial if it had just taken a couple more months for that application process to happen. That's the end of my telling of my dad's stories. And it gives me a lot to reflect on. But what I'd like to do now, I think, with it being 1030, is just hear if from any of you, if you have any observations or reflections or questions. I have a microphone. Does anybody have a question that they'd like to Well, for my father, I think some of the worst things was what was happening in the school. Konstanz didn't have quite as much discrimination and persecution as some other parts of, of Germany did. My dad thinks it was because it was right on the border with Switzerland. And so 
the people there were maybe could see that just a mile away over in the, on the Swiss side of the border, Jews were considered okay. And I think the Nazis themselves toned down the persecution there. But my dad was still really overwhelmed a lot, especially when he went to, um, into the auditorium and had to listen to all of these hateful speeches from, from uh, Hitler that was happening. In fact, he said that once, uh, I guess it, it, in the school auditorium, you actually stood. There weren't seats. You stood during the assembly. And uh, once he actually fainted in the middle of one of these speeches, which caused a little bit of commotion. Everyone stopped paying attention to Hitler because little Fritz in the back of the room had, had collapsed. My grandfather, um, I think especially when he was a traveling tie salesman, there were some people who for instance, refused to buy from him and complained to the manufacturer and said, why are you sending a Jew to my store with your tie selections? And of course, at the concentration camp, he was treated very severely because he was Jewish. Was your grandfather's story like affected in the like Kristallnacht, or was it just like the synagogue? Was um, what happened to my grandfather? No, it like, was his store. Oh, like, his affected. store. So by then he had sold the store, so it wasn't a Jewish-owned store anymore, and and so I, I suspect that it was fine that nothing happened to it. Um, uh, and there was, as I said, Konstanz, there's a little bit less vandalism during Kristallnacht in uh, Konstanz than in other cities throughout Germany. In fact, that was why um, the Gestapo agents had to blow up the synagogue, was because when the originally Gestapo agents came into the town and told the town officials, okay, you're all going to now have a spontaneous riot against your fellow Jewish uh, townspeople. And the town officials and the Christian townspeople were very reluctant to do that. They really didn't want to do it. They saw no reason to do it. And so the Gestapo agents tried to set the building on fire themselves. And when they couldn't do it, they got someone to wire it with explosives. We need two microphones. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> um, when you came to America, what, um, did he still face like the same kind of discrimination, even if it was less, because like the war was still going on? Yeah. I'll repeat the question. Sure. So, did my dad and his family face discrimination here in the U.S. once they came to the U.S. And there was certainly anti-Jewish sentiment here in the U.S. at the time. Uh, but they were living in New York in what were fairly large immigrant Jewish communities. So in fact, uh, my dad's stories are, are actually more about the people who were nice to him, like a, a local um, grocer who had, uh, I think it was owned by a Greek family. And they knew that uh, my grandparents had had a lot of trouble finding a job. They, it took them quite a while. Um, and because, in fact, because my grandfather had that stiff elbow, it was hard for him. Um, and what this grocer would do at the end of the week, like on a Saturday evening, would sell all their leftover food at a ridiculously low price to my dad's family. So he has more stories about the people who were nice to him than about people who discriminated, aside from those kids the first couple of weeks. <laughs> 
father didn't get into America, could he go to Switzerland? Could my father have gone to Switzerland instead of coming to the United States if the immigration process didn't happen? And he could have until they had completely closed the border, but it, life wasn't really that great if you were a refugee in, the, in Switzerland. They had refugee camps. So if you came to Switzerland without a visa, you would end up just being in a refugee camp with nowhere else to go, no way to make a living. Swiss government uh, is very particular about um, who's allowed to work in Switzerland. And it really made it so, it's sort of a very agonizing decision for my dad and his family almost every day. There was sort of the question of, is it worse to stay here, to, to sort of tough it out, to, to wait for our, um, the visa to come through, the permission to come to the US? Or has it really gotten so bad where we, we actually need this is it. We've got to flee. We've got to take our chances. We'll just go to Switzerland and be a, a, uh, a refugee there. So my grandfather had another very interesting story about, not one that I heard from him, but heard through my dad, about Kristallnacht um, and just about how tough those decisions are about whether to stay or whether it's time to flee. When he was arrested, he was put in a car uh, by those two Gestapo agents and driven away. The two agents went to a store, stopped in front of the store, and told my grandfather, we're going into that store to buy something. You wait in the car. And then they both went into the store. Now my grandfather is sitting in the back of this car, and he is thinking, why did they do that? Are they actually, you know, secretly against the Nazis and they're trying to give me a chance to escape? Is it because I'm a veteran and veterans are very well respected in Germany and they feel bad for what they're doing? Maybe that's what it is and they, and they really want me to go. Or are they waiting because they, you know, they want to see me try to escape and then they're going to capture me and say, look, even Mr. Ottenheimer, is, who's a war hero, look how, you know, how cowardly he is. He tried to escape from lawful uh, you know, arrest. Um, so are they going to arrest me again? Or maybe they're just going to shoot me and just, if I try to escape. If I try to escape, should I go back and get my family? And should we all try to go across the border? Or should I just go and try to? So he's sitting there in the car just trying to figure out what to do, he decided, as a lawful German citizen, he would sit in the car because he was told by officers that he was under arrest. And he would wait. Eventually, the Gestapo agents came out of the store and um, got back in the car and drove him to, Auschwitz, to Dachau. So that's sort of a, just an example of what everyone had to decide almost every day um, during this period in Germany. Um, do you know how many families were smuggled over the border? Do I have any, have I been in touch with any of the families? Like, who, do you know how many families were smuggled? Uh, my dad said that about 300 people were, they were able to smuggle over the border. So I, I don't know, you know, that could be something like 100 families or something like that. So that's, that's the number that I have, though. Yes. How many countries uh, were taken over by Nazi control around uh, Germany? Well, hmm. So the question was, how many different countries were taken over by Germany? And there were certainly France and Poland. Austria, I said, was annexed. Netherlands. The Netherlands, Belgium. There's a, the, I, I know my dad's story much better than 
than uh, World War II history. But there was a, a good portion of Europe that was taken over before the U.S. joined the war and started to fight, fight back. And they tried to take over Russia. They tried to invade Russia. They had had some peace agreement, quote, uh, peace. And, and then, then they, they and then they went to try to conquer Russia, and then that turned to be the pivotal. That was a, a big that, mistake. That was probably yes. Hitler's big military mistake, and that changed that after the, the failed takeover in Russia. That changed the war. It still took two years. But that's, yeah. Terrific. Thank you so much, Mr. Ottenheimer. We're going to have to pause it there, folks, to make sure that you get to lunch on time. So we're going to. That will be our last question, unfortunately, but thank you for taking so many. Um, we would love to just give one more round of applause. Um, if there was any last, I know there's a couple hands up. If you wanted to come down on your way to lunch and ask a question as you leave, that would be okay. That's okay with you, Mr. Ackerman. Absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and we just have a small token of, of thanks for both Mr. Ottenheimer. Oh. Thank you so very much. Thank you. And for Rabbi oh. Karen Citrin, which will come in a little bit. But thank you, guys. Um, you guys are going right to lunch, so you can go. Oh wait, hang on. They can go to advisory. Advisory first. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. We're going to advisory first. Um, why don't we start with Ms. Whalen? Your group can go first. And Ms. Donovan, your group.